What have you become? Well, you just went in and with your tongue. It's your mom, dude. Also, there was blood on his hands. There was blood on his hands. Where did that come from? He f***ed his mom. Yeah. I didn't think it could get worse than I feel, seeing full frontal nudity of Eamon. I feel tainted holding this sword. Uh-huh. You know, I know it was a, a tradition to touch tips. Uh, <laughs> we shouldn't. No. <laughs> God, tradition broken. That was not... I didn't want to see... I didn't expect it. That was the worst plot twist. That was the best. That was the worst. That was the that was the worst plot twist. Didn't want to see that. Welcome to an episode <laughs> of the Couch Gambit podcast. It's an episode. <laughs> yeah. Look, guys, TLDR. I'll give you just the quick the quick like sentence of what we thought. Uh, it was definitely the worst episode uh, of season two, probably of all of House of the Dragon. It's not gotten better somehow. A lot of it was just standing and talking. Yes, a lot of things about Game of Thrones that I loved was a lot of sitting and talking and mm -hmm. standing and talking. But the political intrigue, the writing, the dialogue, just the scheming was all masterclass. Mm -hmm. That is not really the case in this episode. It's not all bad, by the way. It's not all bad. And we don't need a full on plot for every single episode. Some episodes are great, which is characters interacting. But even that was taken down a notch in this episode, I feel like. And I agree with you. Some a lot of the character interactions felt off, felt weird. The writing was off. The, the writing has hit a weird decline for some reason. So we are starting off from the uh, direct aftermath of the Rook's Rest battle, and yep. we are seeing uh, Corliss and Rhaenyra's reaction, which is mm -hmm. cute, simple, sweet, <laughs> effective. Cute. <laughs> it's cute. It's adorable. So um, <laughs> it's effective. No, seeing Corliss's little tear moment is good, especially oh, yeah. because that's all the action we get from him so far in this series. So it's good to have him do something. And then we get Rhaenyra's reaction. It's fine. It's good. It's effective. Yeah. Uh, Corliss's reactions were really like, yes, like, you know, good snaps, you know, like, fine, I'll applaud. There we go. He had a good tear. That, that, yeah, he had a good he had a good tear. That was a he, really good tear. He expressed sorrow very convincingly with his one tear scene that requires no dialogue. You know, you just see a defeated man approaching his Basically, his this great hall of his that he takes so much pride in, mm -hmm. and it's all meaningless to him now. Yeah, because his <laughs> son, daughter, and wife are now gone. I just feel like this that scene would have been f far more impactful, or at least his depression and despair in this episode would have been more impactful had, I, I think you said it, he had been a little bit more... Active, I guess. Yeah, active in the whole season. In this season, yeah. Corliss in the first season was obviously a man of strategy, a man of power, a man of reason. He and uh, Rennes had the best relationship. He was a really cool, interesting character. In this season in particular, he has done nothing of note. With the comments down below, there's probably going to be some people defending him. Hey, he's still sick. He's still crippled. Whatever. That doesn't excuse mm -hmm. you from just standing, you're still ruling. You're still the master of ships. You still have the biggest navy. That's not an excuse to just have him do nothing and show up occasionally in one scene. Yeah, I think, so what Jacob's getting at is that I feel like there needs to be more of Corliss, like, like overseeing the blockades yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, contributing. Now I get it. People are going to comment, probably they're like, well, he's Lord of the Tides. Why should he be out in the front lines or whatever? Why wouldn't he? He's an established sailor. He's the best sailor, apparently. Yeah. And if you're going to go against the books in certain areas, and I'm not saying that the show does this to its negative effect the entire time, then just give something for Corliss to do. Show a reason why Rhaenyra, later on in this episode, gives him the hand of the king. Because, Queen. like, if you're going to give someone the hand of the king, you need to do something to prove Queen. that you need this or qu whatever. <laughs> Queen... Yeah, okay. Don't yeah. worry, I'm correcting him for Thank you, you for you audience. Whatever. And like if you're go if Rhaenyra is going to give him the position of hand of the queen, they need to show us why he's worthy of that position. Don't just take season one as an example and then just don't provide anything in season two. We still need a follow-up in season two. So inside, they present Mr. Aegon. I was very excited for the presentation of Aegon because in the books it says, you know, 
the metal has infused itself you know, like in crafted his skin. into a skin or something. Yeah, or I whatever. thought that was going to be cool, and it was. It just wasn't what I was thinking. I, I still good, still good. Yeah. The way they peeled it off his freaking skin, and the way that it, the noises that it was making, and the oh, blood yeah, coming the out, noises, it was awful. Sucked. And I love that Allison basically uh, uh, gazes upon her failure. <laughs> uh huh. Mm hmm. Uh, not again. When I say gazing upon her failure, I don't mean necessarily that like her son's. A fa- I mean her son's a failure. Her failure uh, and her role as a mother. Yeah. Also, uh, it's a callback to the last episode. You should watch it because no one else has. True. <laughs> her words in the last episode were really the reason that he got that on the dragon. Acted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now it's his choice, of course. You can't mm-hmm. put all the blame on Allison, but at the same time, like the fact that she wasn't being the mother that he needed in the moment is the reason he leapt on his dragon and went off yeah. to battle. Because it, it just seems like no matter how many times Aegon seems to call for mummy, she always walks away. She's never there. Man, Allison sucks. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. People who are Allison stand, I get it. Shitty, shitty hand. Yeah. But must I say it again? That doesn't mean you can defend it. No. You can explain it. Comments down below. Let's start trending. Allison sucks. Hashtag bad mom. Hashtag bad mom. The moment they take the armor off, I think that's when you also start hearing his labored breathing, too. Mm. Man, like hearing him breathe like that, I was like, ooh, like that's, it is rough. That's some Darth Vader nonsense right there. Yeah, and also like it kind of like makes me like when I whenever I was looking at damaged Aegon, I was thinking like, ah oh, yes, like his father. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's a great callback. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that was their intention. If it wasn't, I mean, hey, they did it anyways. Um, they did a good job with it. If oh, that's yeah. the case. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure Allison's probably the, there's there has to be a little bit of Allison that sees him. And just like, not again, Tech. I was like, I have to take care of another dying, crippled man. Yeah. Fuck. That looks like a freaking wrinkled thumb. Uh, and then then Eamon shows up, and he's just looking at his handiwork. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and the, the, the line is like, ah, oh, yes, someone was, must rule in his stead. And he looks to his mom, and Eamon probably knows. He's like, my mom's probably going to try and... Uh, take control. I will not let this happen. No. Gosh, every scene with Mazaria. I'm sorry. If Look, I, I get that apparently, you know, like, she's supposed to be like the master of whispers for an era. She's fucking boring. She is like, not useless, but yes, she is my least favorite character. I don't know anyone that loves her the most. I don't know anyone that enjoys her, really. She is not an interesting character. Yeah. And every scene, in most scenes, every time she's having a conversation with someone, it's either about the people or it's about her backstory. And about It's like, I was a survivor, and I'm going to get it. Like, I don't care. Oh, I, I have zero care in the world for this I, person. I also just, I fucking hate her voice. Oh, it's infuriating. What is it's, with that? Like, it's a weird, weird accent. I don't. I. I, I just don't like it. If uh, I. I just don't. I'm sorry. Like as a comparison, she's the master of whispers, right? Sure. Right. Let's compare her to another master of whispers, Viserys. Hang on. What's Viserys? his name? Viserys. Hang on. Varys. Varys from That's Game it. of Thrones. They're so similar. Give me a break. It's so similar. <laughs> compare Varys to Masaria for a second. Varys just did his job. We didn't figure out his backstory until later on when he was telling Tyrion is like, yeah, I was in the circus and then somebody did something bad to me and now I have them. And here they are. We didn't hear anything about Viser- oh, v- Dag, damn it, Varys, Varys until later on. Varys was just a mystery to us. He was just someone who operated. Oh. Tyrion even asked him in season two of Game of Thrones, what do you want? And Varys turned, leaned down him and said, if you want to play this game, you'll have to start. And it's a mystery. And it's a great mystery. But you know how to immediately destroy that? You just tell the audience your backstory. You just tell this is what I'm all about. And all the mystery and all the intrigue is gone. Well, and that's one of the biggest problems with this episode. Well, but specifically about this character because she's never been interesting. It's it's so simple messaging. When she talks to Rhaenyra in this episode about like getting the people on your side, like, yeah, no crap. And there's nothing clever about anything she's doing. She's giving her vague options of what to do, but there's no real planning on what she's doing. There's no real like like we don't get to see the behind the scenes of what she's doing. And again, be- because there's no mystery to the character, we're not intrigued by her. So whatever she's doing, I don't care about even her. Yeah, even her advice to Rhaenyra, by the way. What, at least from my understanding of Rhaenyra's fucking 
the reason why she's so fucking pissed is that she hates basically being essentially told and shown that nothing that like she says or wants to do really matters to the people around her that like she can't really do anything so let others do it for her didn't she basically oh if you cannot do something have others do it for you yeah a bit of contradicting and, and i'm like i'm like isn't that why Rhaenyra is pissed? Yeah, that's like the last thing you tell her. Mm-hmm. At least, at least from what I understand of of why Rhaenyra is pissed, I'm, it's not everything. But at least that, from what I've gathered, that's like a at least a pretty decent, um, like one of the like reasons why she's so angry and upset. Which again, so her council scene does parallel Allison's, right? It's a good parallel. Yeah, it's a good parallel. It, it, it's just um, like with Rhaenyra, it's just constant. It's kind of, yeah. I, I get it. You know, her counsel doesn't take her too seriously, right? But the show is really going out of its way to be like, like all oh, the patriarchy, like women shouldn't, you know, have any say in at, like in matters of war or whatever, right? To be fair, uh, Rhaenyra hasn't really fucking done anything. No. One of the things she does is to meet with Alicent. You Without know? telling the counsel. Which, by the way, I, I like the scene, but like, I can understand why the counsel be fucking pissed yeah they're like you did fucking what like they're uh, like say what you want about the council they're on Rhaenyra's side and they're trying to look after her in the best way possible so yeah I get why they would be pissed we've already went over this in the last episode so I agree with you yes of course they'd be pissed in this specific scene I agree with you it's a great parallel between Allison and Rhaenyra I think Allison's scene is done a little bit better when they like have that little like smooth camera tracking uh to Allison and the and the sound starting to muffle and we're hearing a lot of Allison's breathing I think this I think it's great I think it's awesome and then again with Rhaenyra I think it's a good parallel I've already seen this so many freaking times I've seen Rhaenyra and her counsel disagree have issues all the time, and it's so repetitive at this point. The main problem with with the whole dynamic between Rhaenyra and her council is that it's been like this since like episode one, almost. Yeah. Of of this season, at least with Allison though, at least like she's been part of the council, right? She's mm-hmm. taking part in discussions and all that stuff. No one's really talking over her, at least not to my knowledge. I don't remember anything like that. Um, and when Allison essentially gets like the rug pulled out from under her, I don't think they necessarily beat it over your head I, I like there's enough like showing show but they're also like telling at the same time yeah because because in the context of the scene with allison in the council it makes sense for them to say what they say especially when like i think it was like when laris strong was like like what how would it look if we elected for a woman of our own of our own to be basically queen regent when we are basically fighting rhaenyra because she basically wants to do the same. She wants to be seen as, or she wants to be queen. Yeah, and again, to the show's credit, they've established already that it is tradition that a man assert the throne yeah. and that a lot of people would not accept her because of her sex. Yes, yeah, uh, let's move on to uh, maybe a character that has, unfortunately, God's not gutted per se. No, but no, like, not ruined. Not, not, not Tyrion Lannister, or Jamie Lannister ruined. Ah, Nothing no. like that. But done dirty. I, I have say. some concerns with Damon moving forward. May I may I take this one? Please, because I know you're very passionate about it, and I'll kind of put my own two cents on it when you're done. When he's in Heron Hall chopping wood, like a man, booyah. Like a man. Like a big boy. He's chopping wood. He goes to talk to Alice Rivers. The biggest problem I have with this scene is Damon's blatant explanation of why he's doing what he's doing to a person who he shouldn't be even explaining why he's doing what he's doing. The best thing about Damon in season one and in season two was the subtlety that Matt Smith betrayed his character in and even the writers gave him. You don't really know what Damon is thinking the vast majority of the time. And even when you're given scenes where he's sitting down and talking with other people, a lot of the times he just doesn't say anything. Some of the best dialogue scenes is with Rhaenyra and Damon in the first couple episodes of season one. And uh, Rhaenyra asks him a couple questions in like High Valyrian and Damon just is silent. And you kind of get to infer like what he's thinking. The subtlety and the expressions that Matt Smith, the actor and the writing gave Damon 
gave him so much death, so much intrigue, so much power to his character in that he was such a wild card, so interesting, so intriguing. And it was all, not all, but a lot of it was wasted and thrown away in this one scene. When Damon talks to Alice Rivers and just blatantly tells her what he wants to do, which apparently is now go take King's Landing, take the throne for himself. If Rhaenyra wants to rule next to him, then she can. But the realm needs a man. The realm needs a man to rule. This felt so oddly out of character, not only in the fact that he's telling Alice Rivers, which he doesn't have the relationship with her to tell her anything. If he's not going to communicate with his brother or Rhaenyra, what he thinks half the time, there's no way he's going to be telling Alice Rivers these things. But even so, I don't think Damon would ever say what he really, really means. And that just takes so much depth and so much intrigue away from who Damon is as a character. Because the best part about him is that you don't really know what he's thinking half the time. And he just spells it out for the audience in the most uninteresting, of course, way possible. Because mm -hmm. you can say one, you can say two things in this scenario. Yes, that might be part of Damon's character. Yes, he might want to take power away from Rhaenyra. But what's more interesting? Not knowing what Damon is after, and then Rhaenyra and Damon meet after a while, and then there's tension between them because you don't know what Damon's going to do, just like in season one when he was talking to Viserys and you didn't know if he was going to take power from him, or this, where he's just blatantly kind of becoming the villain. What's more interesting? I mm -hmm. think most people would choose the latter because it just is. And you've taken that away from Damon in this scene, and I feel like you're doing damage to his character. Let's talk about that for a second. Oh yeah. my freaking, oh my, oh my, oh my, he bangs his mom. I'm in a dream, but like. Right, but he's still. I know. I didn't expect, like, I didn't know who this was up for a second. Like, that's written. No, it's not. It's not Rhaenyra. And then you figure out at the end of it, it's so much worse. At first I thought, like, is that like Viserys' dead wife? Actually, yeah, the, I the, kind of thought that that's what it was for a second. Maybe I, you know, I was thinking, like, I don't know who this is. I've never seen her before. She obviously has golden hair, so she's obviously a Targaryen of somewhat. Golden. And then, oh, my gosh, it's so much worse. Golden hair. Yeah, golden hair. They have golden hair. They're Targaryens. Is it described as I mean, uh, white, but is it described as golden like the books or something? I know Lannisters have golden hair i'm gonna say yes but i might be wrong i think he might be wrong guys. i i'm gonna say i'm right uh, hashtag of gold of hair i really didn't want to see that yeah no like again because it just seemed it just seemed like a really i really bad excuse to just somebody come on screen yeah somebody somebody comment down below what do you think that they were trying to get at in this scene i can kind of guess but that doesn't justify anything of what i just saw because i was not ready for it i didn't want to see it or in it anyway but as it was going down it's like it's almost over surely and then the drop at the end is like you're my favorite son like oh this is disgusting is what this and, and is and again it's okay it's gonna sound bad when i say it like this but oh dear it's not it's not the fact that I mean, I, I still think it, it it was unnecessary, but it's less that he had he fornicated with his with dream mother. It's more of like how they really wanted to show it. Yeah, they showed it for a while. Like, they showed a lot of it, too. Yeah. Imagine being the director and this saying like, so this is your mom. Say hi. <laughs> He's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> now take off your clothes. But. <laughs> Let's move on to really probably my favorites. No, maybe either top. It's like top two scenes. So Jaceris Jace, we're going to call him Jace for short. So he decides to be a great son. Oh, yeah. He goes to um the phrase, right? He goes to basically negotiate, right? Without yep. mommy dearest's, you know, permission or anything like that. But man, he gets the job done. He's very smart He's and so efficient. I don't know why so my voice cracked there, but it was. Yeah, it's very true. I love how <laughs> so when he's like, oh, yes, you will have my protection and you see the phrase look at each other. They're like, ah, like, is that enough? And maybe he plays his hand or add more to the pie, as it were. Yeah. Uh, too quickly. But again, it just shows maybe again, he is not as experienced in this yet. He's just trying his best to, like, 
you know, make connections and, you know, get more help for his mom. Yeah. And so he quickly, seeing that they're not fully convinced, he's like, you also have my uncle's protection. Yeah. Has Damon consented to this? He will do what his queen says. Yes. Hopefully. Which, yeah, exactly. It's a gamble on his part. Mm -hmm. Uh that could come back to bite him. We don't know. When the phrase tell him, we don't fear what you've previously stated, we fear freaking Vagar, which is understandable, mm. especially because he just killed Melis. Jace's uh, response, yeah. fucking banger. Please His response it. is like, you fear a dragon leagues away when my dragon is right freaking there. And they don't really have any like comeback to that. They're like, yeah, that's true. You're, it, that's very true. And like, it's a good comeback. Oh, yeah. It was that was a boss move on his part. And the bossness really continues on because, yes, he might be like inflating a few of his promises a little bit, hoping that maybe some of this will turn out the way he hopes. But he's still negotiating. And at the very end, they say, hey, also, we want Heron Hall. And Jay says, OK, I might be able to get you Heron Hall. But if I'm going to give you Harrenhal, my queen is going to want more than just your crossing. And they say, what do you want? And then he stands up, leans over, and he says, bent knees. And that was the time I liked this kid. He's oh, yeah. awesome. So let's end with the last scene between Rhaenyra and Jace. I think that if you're going to like sum everything up in this scene, this has the two, the one issue and the one good thing about this episode in one little room doing the thing that I hate and the thing that I love. Jace coming in the room and laying things out for his mom. Oddly enough, being a oddly better leader than her in this situation and Rhaenyra not leading, just complaining, not doing anything, even though she totally could do something because she's the queen. Because the big thing I just don't understand is that Rhaenyra, she wants to act, but like, She's acting as if she needs the permission of the people around her to act or to do what she wants to do. Yeah. When she knows, no, I'm the queen. Bro. And if you want to say that she at least wants to be a democratic queen and get the permission of her council because she wants the wise council, then I don't think that's the case because she obviously no. wouldn't go to see Allison. Exactly. So you so. Obviously, that's not yeah. the case. Oh, so at that exact point, thoughts, yeah. throw the superiority card down. Um, I'm sorry. I'm the queen. I'm going to get on my dragon because after Rhaenys is dead, I'm the most experienced. Why are you whining and not acting? Especially as your son. Oh, yeah. The next thing I don't like about this scene. Yeah. You need to be mindful of how you deliver exposition. When Jace is like, well, we do have we have two dragons who can stand up to Vagar. Right. And we're, of course, Rainier already knows this. Right. Um, but then he's like, their names are Silverwing. And what was the other one? Whatever there were. I don't remember. The he names. Na like, you know, the, but the, it's the way he says it. Their names are this and this. And I'm like, what? It felt weird. I'm like, OK. And now for people like, why is that weird? Why is that bad? In what context would Jace feel the need to name drop the dragons especially in the way he named it it's not he's talking to Rhaenyra he's telling the audience we have the dragons named Dreamfire and the, or not Dreamfire whatever their fucking names are Silverwing and something else okay it's it's very like I am telling the audience this information because the audience will benefit from this information instead of like it needs to come out organically overall this this episode this is definitely the the worst episode in all of House of the Dragon season one and two Agreed. Uh, it's the it's it's the weakest by far. Yeah, it's not without merits because obviously there's some good things in this episode. It's not all terrible. It's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but obviously it is on a weird decline with this season for some reason. This was the show that I was looking forward to the most mm -hmm. this year. I love the first season. I love, 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 love the first season House of Dragon. And I don't think that season two is being put under the same care as season one, personally. Again, if you've noticed, for people who've been staying tuned to our, our reviews, or really our discussions, um, you'll notice that our enjoyment was a gradual decline. The first episode for me was like nine out of ten. Great episode. Really good episode. I really liked the episode. Episode two was like strong eight, light mm -hmm. nine. You know? Yeah. Episode three, we were like teetering on to like maybe like 
a like like a strong seven, maybe 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 eight still. Episode four was like a seven. Yeah. Episode four was a seven. Even the battle, yeah. like the bad, the second half of that episode was good, but that first half leading up to it wasn't up to snuff. Now this episode comes out. Yeah. Like seriously, no, seriously, if we're starting from this high point, right? And again, gradual decline. But in this episode, fucking, oh my, it's a huge fucking Nose dive. dip. That's the tip. I thought we were. It looks like tradition has not been broken quite yet. Beep. Yay! Beep, beep. We touch tips. Congratulations. You you got to see two men touch tips. Awesome, awesome.